الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين رب إشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحل وقتة من لساني يفقه قولي إن شاء الله today we're going to be uh, talking about one of the lives of the scholars of the past and the scholar we'll be talking about today is the scholar by the name of Imam Az-Zuhri and Imam Az-Zuhri his real or full name was Muhammad ibn Muslim ibn Ubaidillah ibn Abdullah ibn Shihab Az-Zuhri and Imam Az-Zuhri was from Medina so he was born in Medina he was raised in Medina he studied in Medina and he's actually from the same lineage as the lineage of our blessed and beloved messenger Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam from his ascendants from his forefathers is Zuhra and from the uh, lineage of the messenger of Allah sallam is Qusay because you have Abdul Muttalib ibn uh, Hashim ibn, ibn Abdul Munaf ibn Qusay so Qusay was one of the forefathers or one of the fathers of the messenger of Allah sallam and Zuhra who is one of the ascendants of Imam Zuhri the scholar of today's the topic of today's lecture and the personality of today one of his uh, ascendants was Zuhra uh, one of the ascendants of the messenger of Allah sallam was Qusay both of these two were brothers so they have a similar uh, lineage and uh, also from his uh, from the lineage of Imam Zuhri rahimahullah is uh, someone who had links to the side of the mother of the messenger of Allah sallam. so Imam Zuhri rahimahullah had uh, relations from his uh, you know ascendants who for example uh, Zuhra, uh, Zuhra the person that he's named after Imam Zuhri an individual called Zuhra Zuhra had a son called Wahab and Wahab had a daughter whose name was Amina Amina bint Wahab. So Imam Zuhri from both sides okay, has relatives going back to the Messenger of Allah والسلام, and the tribe he is from is the Zuhra tribe, Banu Zuhra. And it's a famous tribe because there were many companions of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, who were from this, from this tribe. And from those companions uh, that belong to this tribe were the famous companions and also the ten who were promised paradise uh, Abdurrahman ibn Awf and also Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas so these two were from the same tribe as uh, Imam Zuhri rahimahullah and Imam Zuhri was born in the year 58 Hijrah and this was during the leadership of Muawiyah radiallahu an so he was born after um, the, the 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 time of the leadership of the the arba the khulafa arba the four uh, the four leaders the four companions of the messenger of Allah sallam and he was at an age where or he was born at a time where Muawiyah radiallahu an was only the leader for a couple of years so at the age of two uh, Muawiyah passed away and his son Yazid became the leader in the year 60 Hijrah. So Zuhri was born in 58 Hijrah. Muawiyah passed away radiallahu an, in the year 60 Hijrah. His son became the leader uh, and his son died in the year 65 Hijrah. And then Marwan ibn Hakam became the leader. So he's one of the famous leaders of the Muslims, early generations. And Marwan ibn Hakam, when he passed away, his son became the leader. Who is his son? Marwan ibn Hakam. Abdul Malik. Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. 
the famous, the famous leader of the Muslims. And Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, uh, as we we'll mentioned, he had some interactions with Imam al-Zuhri. And in fact, they had a very close uh, relationship. And Imam al-Zuhri was very close to uh, the family of Abdul Malik ibn Marwan and also his children and the leaders who came after his sons. As we said, Imam al-Zuhri was born in Medina and when uh, people describe him, they see he was someone who was short in height and he didn't have a thick beard. He only had a few long uh, strands of hair okay, on his beard and his cheeks were very, very khafif, meaning very light. He didn't have that much hair on his cheeks. So he had a, you know, a very light beard. You know, some people naturally, they don't have a thick beard. They just have a, you know, a very small amount of hair on their, on their face. And scholars also say that he was most likely an orphan. He wasn't somebody who had uh, uh, parents uh, at, a, at an older age. They passed away uh, when he was younger. Some narrations mention he had a brother who was older than him, who took care of him, but they were poor, they weren't, uh, they weren't a family who were very wealthy. And one of the reasons for this is that in the lifetime of Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, the leader of the Muslims, he was involved in an altercation or a, or a battle with the companion Abdullah ibn Zubair radiallahu anhu. We mentioned uh, a few weeks ago when we talked about the life of some other scholars that Abdullah ibn Zubair refused to give the Pledge of Allegiance and he took over Hijaz, Mecca and Medina and th that area. And so as a result of this, Abdul Malik ibn Marwan basically fought uh, Abdullah ibn Zubair and one of the people who fought alongside Abdullah ibn Zubair was the father of Imam al-Zuhri. So Muslim ibn Ubaidillah, because Imam al-Zuhri, his name is Muhammad ibn Muslim ibn Ubaidillah. Muslim ibn Ubaidillah was one of those who basically fought alongside Abdullah ibn Zubair. And it's known that Abdullah ibn Zubair wasn't somebody who uh, you know, would spend lots of money, lots of wealth on his, you know, his descendants, on his his family or his children, for example, okay, because he was, you know, of the opinion that you know wealth should be uh, preserved and taken care of. Uh, you know, the Muslims should take sh should be given the wealth and so on and so forth. You know, as some people do, they expect their children to work for their wealth and to take, you know, to to um, you know work for their wealth and not be given uh, lots of wealth. So he was somebody who would spend his wealth, you know, for other uh, for other for other things, for the sake of Allah, for charity and so on and so forth. And as a result of this. Uh, Muslim ibn or Muhammad ibn uh, Muslim ibn Ubaidillah, the father of Imam Zuhri, was also uh, a companion of Ibn Zubair, and so he had uh, similar tendencies as well. So the point being, when Imam Zuhri uh, was growing up, okay, and when his parents passed away, he wasn't somebody who had lots of wealth, and he even himself mentions this. He says that I grew up without money, except for what I was given from the diwan, from the office, from the government. You know, monthly stipend that they would receive. And he said, I used to learn genealogy, okay, uh, you know, your family tree, where you came from, Ansab. He said, I used to learn this from Abdullah ibn Thalaba, who was one of the scholars of Medina. And at the age of around 23 years old, he traveled to Sham, specifically to Damascus, in search of knowledge. Uh, one of the things that's mentioned. Uh, about his journey is that he went to Sham and the, and, the, and the historians, they discuss why he went. Some of the historians, they say that he traveled in search of knowledge. Others, they say because he was poor, okay, he felt like if he goes to Damascus, which was the capital at the time, that maybe there would some, be some means of him earning some kind of you know, wealth and earning some kind of sustenance, as people do today. You travel to another place because maybe there's opportunities there. So he traveled to Damascus and he went to the Umayyad Masjid. And scholars, some scholars, they say that, you know, both of those intentions could have been the case. He could have traveled in search of knowledge and also, you know, for some kind of sustenance, okay, as opposed to what he was, you know, 
uh, what you know his situation in Medina and what his situation in Medina was like. So scholars they say he went to uh, Damascus and he went to the Umayyad Masjid, which is the biggest masjid uh, you know in Damascus up till today. And he went to the masjid and he was listening to uh, the lecture or a class of one of the scholars by the name of Qabisa and a famous scholar in Damascus. And people around him, they, were, they asked him, they said, where are you from? So he said, I'm from Medina. They said, what's your name? He told, him, he told them his name and they found out he is a Qurashi because he has the same lineage as the messenger of Allah Sallallahu So they asked him a question about inheritance, a specific question about inheritance. And he answered them. And so they said to him, they said, Qabisa, the scholar that this gathering you're in, this scholar is called Qabisa. And Qabisa was asked by the leader himself, Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. He was asked by Abdul Malik about this question and he didn't know the answer. And Qabisa asked all of us, all of his students, this question and we didn't know this question either. So wait here okay, until Qabisa comes and talks to you. So then when the lecture finished, Qabisa came and he asked him about him, who he was, where he came from. And he asked him this question and he answered the question based on a narration that he heard from Umar radiallahu an. And Qabisa said to him, he said, come with me and we're going to go to Abdul Malik ibn Marwan himself, the leader of the, of the Muslims. So he said, we went to the palace of Abdul Malik ibn Marwan and at sunrise, by the time we, we were called by the guard, it was sunrise, the guard called us in and Abdul Malik ibn Marwan was there with the Mus'haf in front of him. So he closed the Mus'haf, he was reciting Quran. So he closed the Mus'haf and he asked him, what's your name? <coughs> he told him his name. He said, I am Muhammad ibn Muslim ibn Ubaidillah. And of course, Abdul Malik ibn Marwan was the one who fought Ibn Zubair. And his father was with Ibn Zubair. And so of course, he knew you know, who this individual was. So he said, Qawmun na'aruna fil fitan. Al Malik ibn Marwan, he said to Imam Zuhri, he said, you're from a, a, a people who, who love to get involved in fitan because his father was from those who rebelled. And so uh, Imam Zuhri he said, you know, this is something which happened in the past. It's something which has, you know, is gone, it's, it's, it's done. And so Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, he asked him about inheritance. He asked him some questions about inheritance. And because he was young in age, okay, he was still developing in knowledge. So he answered the question, but he made some errors. And so Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, who is the leader of the Muslims, he corrects him. And he tells him, no, this is, you know, he was correct. He just, he said, you were correct in what you said, but your wording was incorrect. So his answer was correct in the Islamic sense, but he made some errors with regards to the words he used specifically. And <coughs> Imam Zuhri was there and he's young in age and he doesn't have that much wealth and he's in the presence of the leader of the Muslims. And with him is Qabisa, the scholar that was teaching in the masjid in, in Damascus. And it's only them three. And so he thought to himself, I'm never going to get this opportunity again. I'm never going to be in the presence of the leader of the Muslims. And so he asked him for financial help. And so uh, Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, he basically dismissed him. He told him, leave. And Samia so Zuhri, he says that I never felt a time where I felt more, uh, you know, humiliated. Because, you know, in his heart, a person doesn't want to ask, you know, somebody else for wealth or for money. And on top of this, when you ask and you're dismissed and you're basically told to go away, that's, you know, just adding to the humiliation. So when he left, Qabisa, the scholar, he found him later in the day and he said to him, what, why did you do this? You know, well, why, did you, why did you ask that? Because, you, you know, you, you made things worse for yourself. So he said that I thought I'm never going to get the chance again to be in the presence of the leader of the Muslims. So I thought I'd ask. So Qabisa himself gave him some money, a, a quite, you know, a large amount of money. And also he gave him a servant and he gave him a riding beast. And he said, come the next day 
And when you come the next day uh, in front of Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, don't say anything. Just, you know, just sit there, let him ask whatever he wants to ask. You don't say anything like this. So the next day he went back and Abdul Malik ibn Marwan asked him about genealogy, about his lineage. And Imam Zuhri, he said that he would ask me about lineage and genealogy, okay, and Saab, parents and grandparents, and where this person came from, that person, about the people in Medina. And he said that he knew more about the genealogy of the people in Medina than I did, even though I was from Medina. And he got to a stage where I never wanted him to ask me any more questions because he, it was obvious he knew more than me. So, once he had asked him lots of questions about genealogy, he asked him other questions about some of the scholars who were in Medina. How is this scholar and how is Sa'id ibn Musayyib? He asked about Sa'id ibn Musayyib, he asked about other scholars. And eventually, Abdul Malik ibn Marwan basically asked him if he wanted to, <coughs> if he wanted to uh, stay in Sham and teach him and teach his family for, you know, uh, for a, a stipend. And Imam Zuhri, it said that he agreed, and so Abdul Malik ibn Marwan basically supported him financially. And he became close to Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, the leader of the Muslims, and also his, uh, his children who were the leaders after him. And this is how he had a close relationship with Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. Uh, one of the scholars of the past, Imam al Awza'i, he talks about the importance of uh, or he gives an example of the importance of uh, the Qur'an and the importance of being a student of the Qur'an before being a student of knowledge. And Imam, Imam Awza'i, he uh, is said to have uh, had this habit of asking students certain questions whenever they would come to his gatherings and come to his circles. He would ask them, he would say, have you memorized the Qur'an? And if they said yes, he would say, recite from يُوسِيكُمُ اللَّهُ فِي أَوْلَادِكُمْ An ayah in Surah An-Nisa, about inheritance. And if they couldn't recite this ayah, he would say, go back and learn the Qur'an and then seek knowledge. And this basically shows us the importance of learning the Qur'an and having the Qur'an as your foundation, as your base. And this is why the scholars paid so much importance to the Qur'an. And you know, today we have people who don't know any Qur'an, but you know, they're people who feel like they're qualified to, to, to maybe teach or to, to, to do lectures and talks and circles and gatherings when they don't even know how to recite the Qur'an properly. And so in the past, scholars would pay Lots of emphasis on a person understanding the Quran, memorizing the Quran, reading the Quran, you know, uh, having a good understanding of, you know, the verses of the Quran, ayats relating to rulings and so on and so forth. Imam Zuhri, rahimahullah, he was a scholar of the Quran. Scholars they say that Imam Zuhri was somebody who was like an encyclopedia when it came to the Quran. He had gathered like, you know lots of knowledge pertaining to the Qur'an. And even Ibn Kathir, when we read Tafsir Ibn Kathir, many times he'll mention the statement of Zuhri. He'll say, Zuhri said this with regards to this ayah. Also, he was a student of the Arabic language and of inheritance as well and other sciences of Islam. And there's an interesting story which is mentioned about him. Uh, it said that he would learn in Medina from scholars such as Urwat ibn Zubair, a scholar in Medina. He would learn from Urwat ibn Zubair and then he would go home and he had a servant, a servant girl. So he would wake up the servant girl and he would basically just start narrating to her everything that he'd heard from Urwat ibn Zubair. And so she would say to him, why are you telling me this? I'm not interested in what you have to say. Why are you mentioning all these things to me? And so he would say, I know you're not interested, but I'm just revising. So I'm just revising. I'm trying to retain what I've learned. So I'm, I'm mentioning it all to you now. And this shows us the importance of retaining what you've learned. And in fact, one of the ways of remembering what you've learned is to go over it. 
Okay, teaching what you've learnt. It's it's one thing learning something and keeping it, you know, in your head. It's something else actually teaching it to somebody else. That's why sometimes you'll notice you'll have uh, students who are the best students, A star students, Islamically or even or otherwise. But then when it comes to teaching, they're not as good. They don't excel as teachers. And then you have the opposite, which is also the case. You know, you have students who weren't very good students. But when they become older, they actually become very good teachers. And it's probably partly because of the fact that they weren't good students in the first place. You know, because when a student isn't a good student, it takes something special to teach him. It takes a good teacher to teach that student because he struggles. Okay, you have to teach him in a certain way for him to understand. When he's older, he's able to, you know, teach students in a unique way and he understands ways in which he can teach things where the students can grasp it. Because he himself had difficulty in learning. You know, a student who's an excellent student, he's, he's you know, an A-star an student, he'll learn the first time he hears something. It doesn't take any explaining. And so when a student who's very good teaches, I'm not saying all the time, but sometimes, uh, an A-star student, when he teaches, because he learns so easily, he teaches exactly how he learned. Does that make sense? And so because he teaches exactly how he learned, okay, he doesn't go into detail, he doesn't know how to elaborate on his classes or on whatever he's teaching, because when he learned it, it was easy for him. And so they'll say, this is easy, you know, why don't you understand this? This is common sense, it's not hard. Because for him it was easy when he was younger. So it's interesting how, you know, Imam Zuhri here, okay, he would use these methods to teach, you know, others. He would just narrate. And of course, the more you teach others and the more you tell others about what you've learned, the more it helps you. And sometimes it helps you more than it helps other people. Um... He also mentioned a statement where he said, and of course I'm just, you know, we can't go over the whole of his life, but we're just going to mention bits and pieces here and there. He also mentioned once, he said a famous statement, he said that لَا يَرْضَ النَّاسِ بِعَالِمٍ لَا يَعْمَلٍ That the people are never happy with an alim, a scholar, who doesn't act. Upon what is learnt. لا يرضى الناس بعالم لا يعمل. A person who doesn't act upon what he knows, a scholar who doesn't act upon what he knows, the people are never happy with him. ولا يرضى الناس, and the people are never happy بعامل بما لا يعلم. A people are never happy with someone who does things without knowledge as well. So when somebody acts, okay, and does things, and says things without any knowledge, this is something which is looked down upon. And also somebody who is a scholar, somebody who is knowledgeable, okay, and he doesn't act upon what he knows, both of these things are things which are looked down upon. There's stories which are mentioned about the hifth and the memorization of Imam al-Zuhri rahimahullah. Uh, and one of those stories, it's mentioned that Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, the leader of the Muslims, he wrote a letter to the people of Medina. And one of the teachers of Imam al-Zuhri was Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib, who we talked about previously. So he wrote a letter to the people of Medina, you know, a letter from the leader to the people of Medina, to the governor, and they would read out that letter to the people. So this letter was read out to the people of Medina, and the students of Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib heard the letter. And we mentioned about Sa'id al-Musayyib, that he wasn't fond of the leader. He wasn't fond of the Malik bin Marwan. When we talked about Sa'id al Musayyib, he was somebody who was very firm. You know, he, wasn't, he wouldn't mess around. Even when Abdul Malik bin Marwan, the leader of the Muslims, asked to meet him when he came to Medina, he stood outside the door of the Prophet's Masjid and he asked the guard to, you know, can you bring Sa'id al Musayyib to me? But don't irritate him. And so Sa'id al Musayyib said, Go back, I have no need for Abdul Malik bin Marwan. So this was the nature of Sa'id al-Masayyib. He was very, somebody who was very firm. So he never heard the, the letter or the, the person read the letter of Abdul Malik ibn Marwan in Medina. His students heard it. So he asked them, what did, what did the letter say? 
So some of the students would mention one, you know, one thing, others would mention something else. They would mention different things. And Imam Zuhri, who was one of his students, he asked him, he said, would you like to know the whole contents of the letter? So he said, yes. So Imam Zuhri narrated everything that was on the letter from the beginning till the end. And he read it quickly as if he was reading from a piece of paper himself. But obviously he wasn't reading it, he was just to strengthen the power of his memorization. Another story is mentioned about the son of Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. We said that uh, Imam Zuhri basically would uh, uh, spend time teaching the, the family of uh, the leader of the Muslims, Abdul Malik ibn Marwan's children and also their children. One of the children of Abdul Malik ibn Marwan was Hisham, Hisham ibn Abdul Malik. <laughs> and he was also a leader, I think, for a short period of time. Uh, Hisham, he uh, asked Zuhri, Imam Zuhri, because he was like the you know, official teacher to the royal family, you could say. So he asked Imam Zuhri, he said to Imam Zuhri, uh, could you write some ahadith for my son? So that my son could learn some ahadith. And the scribe will write them down. My writer will write them, the scribe will write them, and he will send them to my son. So Imam Zuhri narrated 400 hadith. 400 hadith. And the scribe wrote them all down, and he took the book, and he sent it to uh, his son, to Hisham's son. Later on, Hisham called Zuhri, Imam Zuhri back, and he said to Imam Zuhri, he said, I've lost the book. I don't, I don't know what those hadith were. So Imam Zuhri said, no problem, I'll go over them again. So he went through all 400 again. And then Hisham, he took out the book from the bag. And he said, I only wanted to see how strong your memorization was, how strong your memory was. So he wanted to test the memory of uh, Imam Zuhri, rahimahullah. Imam Zuhri, he was known to be somebody who was very generous, uh, it was said that whenever he was asked for something, he would always give it. Whenever he was asked for something, he would always give it. He would, he would always give something to, some, to, to somebody who asked him for something. And this is from generosity. Even the Messenger of Allah you know, had this, you know, this, this personality of you know, being generous and somebody who was giving. Anytime somebody would come to him asking for something, he would, he would never... Uh, let them go empty-handed. He would always give them something in return. And this is from generosity, it's from good character, it's from the good nature of an individual. One of the lessons we can learn from uh, Imam Zuhri, especially with his relationship with the, the leader of the Muslims, and this is in fact something which the scholars also point out and mention, is how there's no harm in a scholar learning in return for financial benefit. Because Imam Zuhri is one of the greatest scholars from the Tabi'in. He's a Tabi'i. He studied from, from, the, you know, from the companions of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he took a stipend from the leader of the Muslims, okay, whilst teaching the children of the leader. Hisham ibn Abdul Malik and Suleiman and you know other children. And when Abdul Malik ibn Marwan passed away, he taught his children as well as their children. And also from the people he had a close link with was one of the leaders during that time, the famous leader of the Muslims, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, because he was around the same time. So he also had a close link with, Abdul, uh, with Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, rahimahullah. Uh, stories are also mentioned about his pursuit of knowledge. We mentioned he went to Syria in search of knowledge. He, he also traveled there. Uh, the first meeting he had with Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, he was of a young age, as we mentioned. It said he was around 23 or 24 years old. And when Abdul Malik ibn Marwan asked him those questions, <coughs> Some narrations mention that he said to him, go back to Medina and continue learning because I see in you, you know, strong memory and a keenness in learning and sharpness. So he recognized that Imam al-Zuhri would be somebody, you know, who would have lots of knowledge in the future. 
And scholars, they talk about the efforts he would go to in seeking knowledge. And one of the scholars, he says that Imam Zuhri, he would write everything whenever he would seek knowledge. Anything he had, he would write it down. And he, one of the scholars, he said, I saw him with my eyes with slates, you know, with the, uh, the thing you write on, what's it called in those days? Tablets, not these tablets, the old tablets with chalk or they used to have their own pens. He said, I saw him with my own eyes write on those tablets and he used to write hadith on them. Also, uh, they used to say that he used to carry wooden slates or wooden, you know, tablets or wooden slates and he would carry paper with him. So these slates were used as paper, uh, uh, to put paper on them, like a little bench that you would have. Yeah. So he would write on these slates and uh, he would write whatever he would hear. And they said that we used to laugh at him when he used to do this. Okay, because he used to write everything he used to, he used to hear. And so people used to laugh at this because, you know, everything he, he heard, he would just continue writing, he would carry on writing. But of course this helped him. Sometimes it helps uh, certain people whenever they uh, write things down, as opposed to just listening. Okay, when people write things down, it helps them memorize. Also, other scholars, they talked about his companionship with Sa'id ibn Musayyab. And... Uh, Imam Zuhri himself, he says that my knees touched the knees of Ibn al Musayyib for eight years, meaning he studied with Sa'id ibn al Musayyib for a period of eight years. Also, uh, other scholars uh, that he learned from, such as Abdullah ibn Tha'laba, as we mentioned, he would study with him in Medina and he said that I used to study with uh, Abdullah ibn Thalaba in Medina until somebody came with a question and uh, Abdullah ibn Thalaba, who was a scholar in, in, in his own right, he didn't know the answer to the question. So he directed this individual, the one who asked him this question, he directed him to Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib. So he said, I followed this person until he went to Sa'id ibn Musayyib and Sa'id ibn Musayyib answered the question. And since that time he said, I stayed with Sa'id ibn Musayyib uh, and I spent uh, eight years with Sa'id ibn Musayyib rahimahullah. Also Imam Zuhri, he talks about uh, going to Sham and Damascus. We said he lived in Medina, <coughs> but because the family, the royal family or the, the, the leaders, the leader of the Muslims at the time were in Sham, he would have to travel there, okay, in order to teach them. But his base was Medina. And in those days, obviously, it was, I mean, even today, if you travel, it takes, you know, a good few hours by plane. I think two, two hours, one or two hours by plane. I think more than that, maybe two, maybe three hours, two, three hours. So in those days, you know, traveling by, you know, by a horse or by a camel, you know, in those caravans through the desert, it would take, you know, a week or so. So... Imam Zuhri, he says that I moved in between Hijaz and Sham for a period of 45 years. So, you know, he would basically keep going back and forth, teaching uh, Al Malik ibn Marwan and his children, uh, and also teaching and studying in Medina. And narrations also mention that he was somebody who studied and taught in Medina, but in Sham, he taught more than he studied. He was more of a teacher in Sham. So his level in Sham was higher than in Medina. Medina was like the center of knowledge. He had so many you know, students of the companions there. So you know, he would study more there. He would also teach, but he taught more in Sham. So he said that I studied, or I moved in between Hijaz and Sham for 45 years. And he said, I didn't find a rare hadith Neither did I find one who narrated to me a rare hadith which I didn't know. Meaning, because I traveled back and forth, and Sham, of course, in and of itself had their own scholars, you know, he said that there wasn't a time where I heard a hadith which I hadn't heard before because of my travels. 
you know, back and forth. I was accustomed to hearing, uh, you know, the correct knowledge and accustomed to hearing uh, authentic hadith, even if they weren't, you know, that common. But because of my travels, you know, I was basically benefiting. And this also shows the importance, as we've also always mentioned, the importance of somebody traveling in search of knowledge. You know, because generally if a person travels, it broadens your horizons anyway. When you see other cultures, when you see other people, how they live, their lifestyle, their, you know, their cultures, you know, you, you look around and, you know, look at, you know, their, the, the environment and so on and so forth. You know, it broadens your horizons anyway. So when a person travels and he's learning on top of this, okay, it's nur ala nur, it's light upon light. You know, you're benefiting from, you know, the people, you're benefiting in terms of Islamically as well. Other scholars, they also talk about... Um, his etiquette whenever he would seek knowledge. And one of the scholars, he mentioned that Imam Zuhri, he said that I narrated, Imam Zuhri, he says himself, he says, I narrated a hadith to Ali ibn al Hussein. Ali ibn al Hussein ibn Ali, the grandson of Ali radiallahu anhu. He says, I narrated a hadith to Ali ibn al Hussein, and when I completed doing so, when I completed the hadith, he said to me, may Allah bless you, that is how it was narrated to us. So when he would narrate a hadith, he would narrate it exactly. And he was very detailed, and again it goes back to the, you know, the, the power of his memorization. Imam Malik was one of the students of Imam al-Zuhri, the famous Imam of Medina. He was one of the students of Imam al-Zuhri. Imam al-Zuhri was from Medina himself. And... Imam Malik once, it's interesting, Imam Malik, he said once that Imam Zuhri narrated to us, to, to the students, 100 hadith. And Imam Zuhri, he asked Imam Malik, he said, how much have you memorized? So he narrates 100 hadith. Okay. There and then he's asking, how much have you memorized? Okay. Now if I narrated, you know, five hadith, okay, I don't know how many of you would memorize all of them. And of course, don't forget, they were memorized with the names, with the Sanad and everything. Okay? So he said to Imam Malik, how, how much have you memorized? He said, I memorized 40. So Imam Zuhri he said, Subhanallah, you know, look at how knowledge is decreasing. So it just shows the standards at that time. You know, and, and how, you know, as the Messenger of Allah himself, he said that, you know, knowledge will be lost by scholars basically passing away and as time goes on knowledge is diminishing and so this is an example of this but again it shows us in those days the standards and the quality that people expected from their students so Imam Malik another narration is also mentioned where Imam Malik he asked his uh, 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 he asked Imam Zuhri he said that did you ever used to write before he said no. And then he asked, did you not ask for anything to be repeated? He answered no. Meaning there was a certain etiquette and element of manners when you would study. And he's saying that from the etiquettes was not to ask for things to be repeated in the midst of the, in the, midst of the, midst of the teacher actually teaching. So these are, these are just etiquettes of the, of the teachers that they would have in those days. You know, things which maybe is strange to us. But in those days, there was an element of sacredness to, you know, the Qur'an and to ahadith and so on and so forth. So when the teacher was speaking, it was an issue of, you know, showing such uh, manners and etiquette that you wouldn't, you wouldn't say anything. You wouldn't speak, okay, while the teacher was speaking. And this was the etiquettes of the time. One of the scholars, he said that Imam Zuhri uh, did not excel us in regards to knowledge, except that he would ask anything he wanted and wouldn't wouldn't waste any effort meaning he was always open in terms of asking questions you know broadening his horizons you know you know being inquisitive having that inquisitive nature and of course this is something which even islam encourages you know for a person to as allah says don't they ponder over the quran allah says don't you ponder and think and reflect so in fact, Allah Himself encourages us to, you know, to ask questions. Of course, there's a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ saying that the person shouldn't ask too many questions. But, you know, 
there's a difference between a person asking questions with the intention of learning, okay, and asking beneficial questions, and a person asking questions which are trivial, which there's no benefit in, which is you know, the trap that the people of the past would fall into, where they would ask questions where there wasn't any benefit. For example, there's a story which is mentioned about Umar radiallahu an, where there was a person during his time who would ask questions about the huruf al you know, the, the letters at the beginning of the surahs, Alif, Lam, Mim, Kaf, Ha, Ya, Ain, Sad, Ha, Mim, and so on. And he would ask people these questions about what these, what these letters mean. So he'd go around asking different people, what, is this, what, did, what does this mean, what does this mean, what does this mean? Continuously just asking people, even though it's understood that it's not, it's something which isn't known, only Allah knows. And so Umar radiallahu anh punished him as a result of this. Because these kinds of questions, you're causing more problems than you're, you know, benefiting the people and benefiting yourself. Uh, also, it's, all, it's mentioned Imam al-Dhahabi, he says that Imam al-Zuhri, uh, he, uh, in terms of diet, he says he never used to like eating apples. And he used to, uh, used to drink honey, uh, saying that it used to help his memory. So, you know, it was something which he felt like would help his memory. And also he himself, he would say that whoever wishes to memorize a hadith should eat dried grapes. So this is like Imam Zuhri himself mentioning that this is something which benefits, uh, you know, the memory. Scholars, they praised Imam Zuhri. One of the scholars of the past, he said that I haven't seen anyone memorize uh, a hadith and be more precise in the narration of a hadith than Imam Zuhri. Somebody else, he said that if knowledge comes to us from a Zuhri who is in Hijaz, so this scholar, he was in Sham. He said, if knowledge came to me from a Zuhri in Hijaz, then we would accept it. Meaning straight away is something, you know, you wouldn't ask questions about you wouldn't say, who is this person? Where does he come from? You know, I need to ask a few other people. I need to make sure. If he came from Imam Zuhri, basically, we would accept it straight away without any hesitation. Other scholars, they would say that no one from the people of knowledge had what Ibn Shahab al-Zuhri had. Meaning he was unique, you know, in his knowledge, he was unique in his field. And, you know, others, they would say, I never met anyone more knowledgeable than Imam al-Zuhri. And as I mentioned, from the students of Imam Zuhri, rahimahullah, you had <coughs> Imam Malik, the famous Imam of the, uh, of the Muslims, the famous Imam of the, from the former Dahib, and others uh, like Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, the famous leader of the Muslims, one of his students. Uh, also, uh, Ata ibn Abi Raba'a, or Ata ibn Abi Raba'ah, uh, and uh, in fact, uh, also some of the early muhaddithun, Imam Muslim, uh, Imam al-Bukhari, uh, and others. Scholars, they talked about his, his etiquettes and his manners. And they would say that when we would visit Imam al-Zuhri in his house, he would host us with many types of foods. So he was very generous and he was very giving, as we mentioned. And he was also very generous with his hosts. He would prevent, uh, present lots of food okay, when people would come to his house. And... Imam al-Dhahabi, he talks about Imam al-Zuhri and he says that Imam al-Zuhri was modest and he was highly respected in the government of Banu Umayyah because he was so close to the leader of the Muslims. But even though he was close, this was something which never hindered his knowledge. It was something which helped him. It was something which helped him promote knowledge. He benefited the leaders of the Muslims from his students was Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, the famous leader of the Muslims. So again, it shows us how, you know, sometimes a person can benefit, okay, when he's basically teaching those who are uh, leaders, those who are in charge. Imam Zuhri, he lived a long life. Uh, he lived until he was 72 years old and he died in the year 124 Hijra. And narrations mention he passed away in the blessed month of Ramadan, the month which is, you know, that we are on the eve of witnessing uh, today. And they say he died in the 17th day of the month of Ramadan in the year 124 
Hijra. And this is uh, the famous Imam Az Zuhri, Rahimahullah. And one of the lessons we can learn from Imam Az Zuhri, as I mentioned, is how a person can have dual intentions when it comes to <coughs> teaching. A person could have the intention of teaching for the sake of Allah, but if a person is paid for what he's teaching, this is something which is, is, is not forbidden. It's not something which is haram, because a person can have dual intentions. You can have the intention of you know, teaching for the sake of Allah, and if you're benefiting financially, okay, if you're being supported financially, then this is also something which is, you know, it's something which uh, there's no harm in. Okay, as long as a person has his intention of doing it ultimately for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So inshallah we'll conclude here. Uh, and if there's any questions, then I'll do my best to answer them inshallah. Okay, so inshallah we'll be obviously stopping for Ramadan. And uh, maybe there may be other classes or lectures taking place after Ramadan. So if anything does take place, then inshallah, uh, you know, that will be confirmed uh, after Ramadan, inshallah. Jazakumullah khair. Subhanakallahumma bihamdika ashadu wa la ilaha illa.